Hey, welcome to another episode of The Synapse. It's Serene. In this episode, Dewan and I sit down on a Zoom call with Abigail Romero, a sophomore at Harvard College studying sociology and statistics. In this conversation, we talk about how she's hoping to enter the world of finance and gain more exposure in that field so that she can bring about positive social change in our existing financial systems. And we talked about how she explored her interests throughout high school and how she's been exploring her interests since the first year of college. And we also talk about how she's seeking to combine the two seemingly distinct fields of sociology and statistics and hoping that bringing those two together would help her instigate positive social change. We also talk about one project that she's launched called the Mentorship Project, which provides mentorship and guidance to underprivileged students throughout their college application process. And Abigail has a lot to say about exploring one's interests, especially when they lie across a whole variety of different fields. And without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Welcome to the Synapse. So today we are with Abigail Romero. She is currently on the Mentorship Project and we're here to talk about her interests right now and how she's exploring her interests and hoping to like use what she learns and put that into her outreach efforts. Welcome Abigail to the podcast. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation. I know we have a ton of interesting things slotted to talk about. To start us off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what interests you've explored um, in the past that's led up to your current interests? Yeah, so I'll give a quick intro and then delve into my background and my past experiences. My name is Abby. I'm a rising sophomore at Harvard studying stats and sociology. And really sort of my interest lies at the intersection or the nexus of those two fields. So studying how data and um, different tools can be used to implement social change, either in enterprises or companies businesses, et cetera. And so to kind of delve into how I came about this in high school, I was like super into disciplinary. And so I did a ton of things. And I, I, I don't know if that would be atypical, but for example, like I took art classes, I was heavily involved in band and music. I did marching band, jazz band, wind ensemble, et cetera. Um, I also did a ton of science research and sort of even within science research, I really love to play around with different fields and um, explore different fields. So I did an engineering capstone project and also did something else in neuroscience which was super fun and sort of outside of that you know i sang for like my church choir group i did a ton of volunteer work i interned at like a physical clinic i shadowed um and like volunteered at a hospital so i just did i did so much and i feel like um, when people ask me like what were you interested in in high school i always have like a hard a really hard time pinpointing exactly what my interests were um just because i i took so much joy in again, really exploring and really doing as much as possible with my time there. A lesson that I, I took away from, you know, doing so much during high school and working within so many fields, you know, everything from like arts and music to science to, um, you know, playing varsity sports, doing band, etc. The main takeaway for me was that there's this myth of being sort of stuck in one discipline or this myth of sort of disciplinary walls. And I really wanted to break down that. And I, I think that really feeds into why I wanted to pursue sociology and stats. So this is actually a fun story. So I came into college like fully expecting to be like pre-med and um, to study <laughs> engineering. And I, I mean, that obviously didn't pan out, but I, I think this is interesting because, you know, at my high school, um, I went to, a really underprivileged, under-resourced high school. So, you know, if you were smart, you were kind of pigeonholed into three careers, like doctor, lawyer, and engineer. Um, so, you know, I, I really grew up with that belief. And I, I think I was super motivated by wanting to help others, especially doing something that, you know, it's meaningful for me, but um, that also leaves a social impact. And the only sort of insight that I had into that was to become a doctor. So I came to Harvard fully expecting to be pre-medicine and um, to pursue biomedical engineering. And then once I got here, I noticed that, you know, there, there like that myth um, was really true that you didn't only have to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer in order to leave a social change. So I, I sort of carried what I did in high school over to Harvard. So I did sort of a ton of activities my first semester here. Um, and I kind of spiraled into what I eventually realized that I really wanted to do, that it wasn't medicine. I really wanted to do something sort of in the social impact space. So that for me was sort of working within business and working within, um, especially I know I'm sort of heading towards finance now. 
exploring the intersection between finance and social impact and business and social impact. So taking this like, interdisciplinary spirit that I had in high school and applying it to my time here at Harvard, I really sort of found my love and my passion for pursuing social impact at a level um, of business and sort of um, corporations and things in that nature. Yeah, that's actually really refreshing to hear because um, a lot of the advice that I've been given, like in a lot of kids in high school, they hear this over and over again, is that you have to have a spike. You have to have something that you specialize in that you can bring value to the world and to kind of avoid being a jack of all trades and a master of none. And there's like that whole mindset being preached to a lot of high school students. And I think it's keeping them from like really exploring things that spark their curiosity. I think it's keeping them from really seeing like their whole potential in a sense. Um, it's mm-hmm. keeping them from exploring, right? And so I think it's really cool that you really um, champion like interdisciplinary uh, exploration. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about like how you went about figuring out like what you want to explore at a given moment. So like right now you're particularly looking into um, statistics and how it ties in sociology and also social impact. So how did you realize that that was kind of the direction you wanted to take, given that you've explored a lot? Because I know a lot of people, they've explored a lot, but they're still clueless, right? It's like, how do I dedicate, how do I focus on a specific thing and um, put time and lots of effort into it? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's such an important question. Um, I know the word passion is such a cliche, but I, I think at least for me, I kind of just chased whatever I was interested in. And over time, I noticed that a lot of that, what I was pursuing was sort of in the social impact space. Um, so an activity I did my freshman year, I was part of an economic policy group at the Harvard Kennedy School. And a lot of the research I did there, like combing through data, putting together policy reports, et cetera, um, you know, actively using sort of my research background that I had in high school, but then applying it in a totally different field, you know, not science, but economics, it was sort of an eye opener for me. Like I realized that, you know, you could do research and you can also um, sort of transfer skills that you previously had into a field that sort of sparks an interest for you. Um, so, so that was like a learning experience to, to know that skills are transferable in that way. And then in terms of falling more into like the social impact space, um, I mean, college is a pretty ripe ground for like advocacy and um, sort of things of that nature. So I met a ton of really inspirational people who had accomplished a ton when I came to Harvard, you know, advocating for human rights or for climate change, et cetera. Um, and, and I realized, you know, that was something that I could also take a part in. So uh, as I sort of talked more with my peers, had out of classroom learning experiences, um, talking with professors, et cetera, I realized that there's so much left to be done in that space. This is something that I didn't formally learn like inside a classroom again. I learned sort of with my experiences with my classmates and my professors. There, there really is this vast array of issues that still need to be tackled. And for me, at least trying to align my interests to um, a specific concentration or career track, I, I really fell into sociology. So sort of at its core, um, sociology is the study of like sociological functions and its people. I really realized that I wanted to study that at a deeper level. So sort of taking all the advocacy efforts and everything that I saw my peers doing and applying it in a more academic setting, I fell into that study. I realized that as much as I love sociology, I would also love to have a quantitative background and an arsenal of tools that would provide me um, a really rigorous way to delve deep into the discipline um, and sort of understand the sort of numbers surrounding the discipline. And I think that's really important. Once you're able to parse through data and synthesize things out of it, you're more readily able, in my opinion, to tackle it. So that's how I fell into statistics, because it provides me with that quantitative background. It provides me with an arsenal of tools that will give me that edge once I, you know, want to delve into social issues and really tackle it as rigorously as possible. I, I love sort of that intersection between studying sociology, but also studying statistics and sort of using the tools I learned in statistics and applying them, again, really rigorously to sociology and having sort of uh, the tools and also the theoretical underpinnings to delve deep into sociological issues and questions. Um, so that's sort of how I fell into both tracks, and I love them both. And I, I couldn't imagine myself doing one sort of in isolation. I think they really stack upon each other really nicely. Yeah, and I love how you just explored all these different topics and you started going after the ones that, topics that you found passionate. I'm just wondering, like, sociology and statistics, except maybe in the research aspect, right? Like, it's 
a pretty uncommon like mix. So I'm wondering like outside of maybe like research, which obviously needs statistics, what other areas could you like actually blend the two? Right. So I think it sort of touches upon sort of my interest in business and finance and also my interest in sociological issues. So, you know, it seems, I would say from a bird's eye view, there's this really stark dichotomy between, um, like you mentioned, like stats and sociology. But I think sort of once you take the lessons that you learn from both disciplines and sort of start to apply them in the wider world, you see that there are a lot more overlaps than perhaps previously, like unbeknownst to us. So, you know, my interest in finance really stems from, or I guess sort of like from a definitional definitional standpoint, Finance at its core is occupied by the management of money, um, cash flows, investments, markets, etc. And then, like I mentioned beforehand, sociology is really interested in the study of sociological functions, systems, um, institutions, and its people. So, again, there there seems to be this dichotomy, but I think there is actually a really interesting intersection between both of them. So, I think what interests me most about sort of those two. Um, Field, sociology and finance slash statistics is that in studying markets and sort of the way capital is moved and having that knowledge, you can leverage that in a way that has social impact. Um, and there's a sort of huge world within finance that is precisely interested in this. For example, um, impact investing, where it is a way where, you know, people provide capital to um, companies, enterprises, small businesses, et cetera, that address a whole host of social issues. Financial inclusion is also something else that comes to mind. So um, democratizing access to capital to resources that traditionally have not had that access is something, you know, that is incredibly important that is sort of explored at the intersection of sort of these two disciplines as well. Something else that comes to mind is micro lending. So, for example, in secluded regions of the world or regions that are underdeveloped or don't have established or easily accessible financial resources and systems, um, micro lending is a way to provide capital for people to empower themselves by, um, you know, lending them money to create a local business, a venture, etc. So, there's a, a, I kind of outlined just um, a couple of them, but there there are a ton of issues that really lie at the intersection of both. And at least from my personal experience, I feel like, again, there seems to be this really stark dichotomy between the between both um, studies and disciplines, but I I don't think this could be further from the truth. And at least, and I'll talk from a personal standpoint, I know sort of a lot of people who are minorities or who are um, sort of first gen um, low income students or who come from uh, underprivileged backgrounds, oftentimes sort of antagonize finance and antagonize sort of corporate America, et cetera. You know, I really understand this antagonization. And I think finance is a really misunderstood field and that, and especially sort of in the demographic that I'm talking about, because this demographic has been obviously historically shut out of positions of power within the field and also the field as a whole. Um, and again, this is a tragedy. And I think my work is really trying to sort of break down this, you know, this barrier and this wall that people have towards finance, because finance can really be leveraged in a way that can have such a huge impact. Um, and, it, and it is such a, a huge field. So understanding, it, I think, really gives power. So for sort of Gen Z and I guess our demographic, um, I know everybody, or at least a lot of people that I've talked to are really driven, again, by social impact and like wanting to leave a change. I, I just sort of want people to know that, you know, you don't have to like go the nonprofit route or you don't have to um, sort of do like work for government, et cetera, in order to have a social impact. You can also do that through fields that might be more non-traditional. So like finance, consulting, et cetera. Yeah, wow, that is so cool. Um, because a lot of people I know who want to leave a social impact, they'll start their own nonprofit or they'll join a nonprofit or they'll learn something along the lines of like nonprofit management, right? Um, and then um, and then maybe go along the lines of like entrepreneurship, starting a company um, to like tackle a problem, right? And there's also people who lobby for legislation and they do advocacy work. And so it's really cool that you talk about like how knowing how to manage money and how like micro lending, it ties into improving um, other people's lives and leaving like a social impact that is beyond just the nonprofit world and um, government world. So I was, so you talked about how there there were lots of issues that you um, wanted to tackle with your 
background or just having knowledge in sociology and statistics. Can you talk a little bit about the types of issues that you've seen or you've witnessed? Which issues exactly would you like to tackle? Yeah, so um, so this is something that I think a lot about and there again are a whole host of things that you could devote your life to. Um, And I would sort of at the moment, I don't don't really think I have like a personal mission per se or something that I feel super strongly about that, um, at least, or something that I've developed that I think I could pursue sort of for the rest of my lifetime. But sort of um, at the moment, I think something that I would love to explore more and potentially make a short-term career out of is sort of democratizing wealth to populations that traditionally have not had it. So I'm sure you guys have heard like of this super crazy stat, but um, the top 10 richest people in the world, oh. as much wealth <laughs> as the bottom 50%, which I think is so insane. Uh, I don't know if, if it's fair to say misallocation of wealth, but really there's this, the way wealth is allocated is, is really unproportional and unbalanced. And, you know, in a world where we have like multimillionaires and billionaires, uh, I don't, I just, I can't sort of rectify that with people living like every day in like absolute poverty or um, not being able to survive off of their own means or, you know, working like 40 hour, 80 hour work weeks and being unable to bring enough money to like feed their families. It just, it's just a little bit insane to me, especially given again that, you know, we have people sort of at the top who harbor so much wealth that, you know, there must be a way to sort of equalize things um, sort of across the spectrum. So that's sort of something that I've been delving into a little bit more and that uh, I would love to explore sort of sort of short term, but in terms of long term goals, um, again, I'm like at a super young age and uh, at sort of really early in the process of, again, exploration and really trying to find the issue that I most sort of honed into and passionate about um, to pursue long term. So I can't give a super precise answer to that, but I do know uh, that I do want to sort of do something that will sort of work within the social impact space to either democratize access or to alleviate a lot of the burdens that we see in our society and sort of our world writ large. I was wondering, like, how are you currently going about looking at what you're interested in? So like you said that you're interested in looking at how money is being distributed and like how wealth might be able to get reallocated. So what kind of activities are you currently involved in or What are you currently doing to explore that field and to understand it better outside of the classroom? Because I know like, I mean, taking class is definitely really helpful as well, but like, I know like it's really helpful to explore things outside. Yeah, for sure. So I've been doing some research with the Central Bank of Armenia this summer, looking into how social spending has changed as like how social spending has evolved as a share of GDP in Armenia and other sister countries and sort of looking at how social spending really impacts different factors such as labor force participation rates, health outcomes, um, et cetera. So again, delving into how capital has been used and channeled in the social impact space and sort of seeing what kind of um, effect that has had in other factors within the country and other countries has been super fascinating for me and definitely learning experience. I've also been working at a venture capital firm, the Blockchain Founders Fund, who is based in Singapore actually. And I've been doing some really interesting research with them as well for their portfolio companies. So I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say because of NDA, but I know (laughs) at least for one of them, I've been doing some work for a portfolio company that specializes in low cost healthcare. So sort of doing research um, sort of with Obamacare and the sort of Obama administration, how they try to tackle that um, research into the gig worker economy and Um, how that's sort of changed landscape. And also, you know, kind of exploring the space from a venture and business standpoint, um, I think really actively feeds into, again, my interest and I guess my areas of study, which is sociology and stats. So those are sort of two off the top of my head. And then a little bit more broadly, um, I've also been writing a book, shout out to Eric Custer, and the PP Fellowship. <laughs> He's awesome. Um, I'm writing a book exploring uh, women of color, especially those who have come to power and their like career trajectories and any obstacles that they have faced and how they have been eventually able to overcome it. Um, and that's been super inspiring for me, you know, talking to some really extraordinary world-class people, especially women of color, and sort of how they've pushed past marginalization 
um, glass ceilings, et cetera, and been able to achieve what they have been able to achieve. So sort of at a broader scale, that's something that I've been pursuing that's been super interesting as well. And I'm trying to think, those are, those are sort of the main three things I've been doing this summer, but again, they all really tie nicely into my interests and also I think really broaden my perspective, you know, working for a VC firm, working for a central bank, and then writing my book have been really phenomenal experiences. Yeah, and I'm looking to sort of build upon that in these upcoming months to, again, hone into what I'm specifically interested in. But yeah, those are some sort of activities that have been fun to pursue. Yeah, and coming from a perspective where I'm interested mostly in the social sciences with a side in economics, I could relate so heavily because I studied ethnic prejudice and like the various like different types of prejudices in general that you could experience through different identities. Shout out Dr. Hill. Just wanted to ask you like what you saw as one of like the biggest problems, right? Uh, regarding prejudice inside America, do you see a problem inside right now? And what do you think you could do to solve that? Yeah, um, so this is, I, I feel like this is a, a really heavy question. I'm, I like beyond a doubt believe that, you know, absolutely America has some prejudice and, you know, it's people have some prejudice. And I, I think this ties back into the systems that have been in place historically that have, you know, shut out people of color, shut out, uh, shut out women, et cetera. For example, we you know we have historically um, had redlining, which have really shut off access for people of color to sort of move up the socioeconomic ladder and buy residences. And, you know, there are a ton of, like, a, a host of things throughout, especially, I think, American history. I'll only talk about that because that is what I'm most familiar with. But a lot of things institutionally and systemically that have been in place that haven't allowed for the democratization of wealth, access, privilege, etc., to anybody who hasn't been white or, you know, particularly male. So, you know, I, I do believe this is an issue sort of at, at a larger scale as to how you go about solving that. You know, there are people who have been like way wiser and way smarter than I have that have sort of come into the space and tackled these issues um, across time. So, you know, whatever answer I give is going to be really unsophisticated and really unprecise, just given that, you know, I have so much more learning to do. No, I, I would definitely say I'm, you know, pretty early in my career and, you know, I'll be the first to admit that I have a ton to learn. Um, so I wouldn't even try to tackle the question as to how to solve it. But I think the important bit is to, for me personally, has been to do research to even understand the scope of the questions that and the problems that do exist. I think once I sort of start exploring a little bit more, start researching more, start talking to more people about these issues, um, reading more on these issues, again, from people who have come before me who have try it again and again to tackle these issues at a larger scale um, of more, I'll have, I'll have a more comprehensive knowledge base to then sort of build off and to tackle, you know, the bigger questions of how, how to tackle systemic oppression and prejudice, racism, et cetera. So, so yeah, to, to, to kind of say what I've been trying to say succinctly, um, I've been on a journey of self-education and hopefully in the future, I'll have some ideas as to how I can actually come in and start creating the social impact and break past sort of any systemic issues that do occur at a large scale here in America. And I wanted to kind of quickly touch upon a lot of people, they talk about like, oh, I have all the resources I have to explore an interest, right? Um, but I think a big thing that goes into uh, per, like exploration all is the culture that you're surrounded with. So like the people they're surrounded with, the expectations that people have on you or, or not necessarily like what expectations other people have on you, but I guess like the support that you'd be able to give and um, the attitudes that people see different things so for example if I were good at math and people look down on like math they're like okay math has no use right and then I would be discouraged to pursue that even if it's something that I personally enjoy solving like the puzzles I enjoy solving could you like talk a little bit about how people can like best position themselves in a way that will keep them motivated exploring their interests even when things are hard it's not the easiest to do your own exploration. Yeah, for sure. So this is also, you know, something that I tackled really early on in my college career. Like I told you, I came in not really knowing what I had to do. So I took a ton of time to explore and, you know, being sort of a woman of color, being, um, you know, born to immigrant parents, being a first generation low income student, I did receive a lot of backlash, you know, when I said, you know, maybe I want to try out finance or I want to explore finance. <laughs> and again, I sort of touched upon earlier why, you know, that backlash exists or I guess my personal say why that exists um, and I think 
surrounding yourself with people who understand sort of the industry or understand sort of your interest and your passions is really important. I know at least on campus, we have like so many clubs and organizations devoted to really niche and specific interests. I think we have like a beekeeping society or something. Um, <laughs> or like we have like a chocolatier. Like we just wait, have- Wait, wait, pause. <laughs> oh, wait, the beekeeping society? I think so. Um, at least that's what I heard. I know Yale definitely has one. So I know like a lot of schools have really niche organizations oh. that have um, really specific interests. So I think at least from a collegiate standpoint, it's easy to find. I don't know if I would say easy, but- um. There, there definitely are areas and spaces to find people who are interested in what you're interested in. And I would definitely recommend, you know, if you have sort of a bizarre interest or um, something that the people around you currently can't necessarily relate to or like you receive um, backlash from them, you know, to kind of branch out and to keep an open mind and continue surrounding yourself with people who sort of understand you and your interests in a way that, you know, maybe your traditional networks haven't been able to. Um, and, and I think that's also why exploration is so necessary that you know, not only does it open up to sort of new knowledge bases and new ways to sort of explore your world and your passions, but it also opens you up to new networks and new people to talk to. And that in and of itself, I think, is incredibly exploratory and um, super insightful. So, you know, being again, being a college student, it's been easier doing that than I would say somebody outside of college just because you have a ton of people interested in a ton of really interesting things um, and are able to find people that are honed into your interests in that way. But um, I've also gotten so much value out of sort of, you know, just reaching out to people, you know, like cold outreach and cold emailing, cold phone calling people in the industry and finding out more about what they're doing. So, you know, getting on a quick phone call with somebody who works in nonprofit space, somebody who works in finance, somebody who has done something in prison reform, et cetera, has also been extremely educational for me, just, you know, knowing their career paths and how they've sort of gotten to where they are. And, you know, surrounding myself with people in that sense as well has been uh, super helpful. I also really believe that if you have an interest or a passion, sort of, you will, you know, pursue that regardless of if the people around you um, kind of antagonize that a little bit. And I think that really sort of came up for me. Like once I wanted to pursue finance, I had to uh, really rethink sort of my network and the people I had around me initially and, you know, kind of carve out space for myself and sort of create something new and create like a new space in that sense as well. I <laughs> I went, I actually went to this really fantastic talk with Mark Cuban, who was on campus. And I was like, <laughs> one of, it was, it was so bizarre being in a room with him, first of all. So I'll tell you. Wait, you met Mark Cuban. <laughs> so I'll tell you the story. It's actually really bizarre. So our Institute of, Institute of Politics, which is housed at the Harvard Kennedy School, is able to attract like really amazing speakers. Mark Cuban. So Mark Cuban was on campus and I really obviously wanted to meet him. I'm just giving my interest. And <laughs> so I was like one of the lucky few to snag a ticket. And so I went there. Oh yeah. And I went there, I think like an hour early, like to wait in line. And they were like, oh, yeah, the room is completely full at this time, so you can't come in. <laughs> so sort of I, I was like, no, like I, I'm going to meet Mark Cuban. So I like pushed my way to the front of the line and just waited. Like whenever somebody left, I would kind of like weasel my way in. So I eventually got to meet Mark Cuban in that way um, and hear sort of his fantastic ideas about, you know, business and on what he's been able to do. And something that <laughs> really stood out for me. So somebody asked him, you know, Mark, you've been able to accomplish so much. You've had such a large impact. Um, especially in business, if there is one business idea that, you know, a young person could pursue that you would recommend somebody um, to pursue, what would that be? And he told us, you know, if I had to tell you a business idea that you had to pursue, then, you know, you're not fit for business because anybody who's in business and sort of pursues a business at a large scale does that because they like truly believe in what they're doing. So he, he kind of, um, really went down on this kid for asking, like basically asking for like a free business idea. But that really stuck with me because <laughs> like nobody, I don't really think it's fair for you to expect somebody to tell you what you're supposed to do. Like if you're passionate about something and if you're interested about something, like you will sort of take that initiative to do it on your own and, you know, not kind of crowdsource or look to your network to potentially give you ideas or fall into what you really want to do. So you know, I've, <laughs> yeah, meeting Mark Cuban was bizarre. And also that piece of advice has really stuck with me, you know, like, like, why should I give you a free business idea? Or why are you asking me about what you should pursue? Like, that should just be something innate and intrinsic. But yeah, so, so that's a fun story. 
No, that's funny. I actually watched um, an interview with Elon Musk, and there's this 17 year old kid who asked Elon Musk, like, "Oh, what? Do you have any tips for young entrepreneurs?" And like, Elon Musk was like, "If you need inspiration, then don't do it." Well, I think that message is actually really good for everyone because, like, it's coming from a pretty niche community where we are quite low income, and the thing is, we find like majors like business and neuroscience is a way out of poverty, although it really isn't poverty, because I believe that I've been entitled to a lot of things. But I feel like some people think of certain majors as a way out. And there's like a certain road that you have to take, and there's no way out of it. And the thing is, I love that message about how if you need inspiration, or if you need me to pitch an idea for you, then you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Of, and encouraging like to diverge from like herd mentality and to make that type of innovation i think that's a great message overall to share to everyone what other initiatives do you believe you've taken up that you think kind of follow that message of creativity and of innovation founding the mentorship project was something that's been incredibly meaningful for me and has been um has taught me a lot even outside of the social impact space like how to run a business how to manage people um, how to delegate, et cetera. So, you know, I came from like an underfunded, underrepresented high school. You know, once I sort of did the impossible and like you said, sort of escaped poverty or sort of things along those lines and was able to apply to college, not only apply to college, but sort of do the impossible by getting into Harvard. I had like a whole swath of messages from people at my high school, like, how are you able to do that? Um, how are you able to apply to college? How did you manage to, you know, pay for it? How did you send out an application process? Etc. So once I was a freshman at Harvard, I took it upon myself to mentor a couple of students. So the college I process just answering like general questions, helping with essays, feedback, etc. Um, and it, it kind of reached the point where I was like literally hosting like college webinars over Zoom and Google Meets um, for these kids at my high school just to provide them with you know that access information that they might have not had due to their traditional support networks either you know not being there and just not having you know not knowing that information. Um, a lot of the kids at my school were first gen low income or had immigrant parents who had you know knew nothing about the U.S. educational system. Um, so I really wanted to be for them, be there for them in that way. And so sort of once I started hosting like these college webinars, I noticed that, you know, there might be so many other people out there, so many other kids and students out there who don't have the benefit of having, you know, somebody who attended Harvard and like can't reach out to them or um, just don't have traditional support networks again to provide them with that information to navigate the college landscape and the college admissions process, which, you know, even for me was incredibly confusing. Um, and, and I would say I, you know, I had mentorship, I had a guidance counselor, et cetera. Um, so I really wanted to do something more, you know, both for the kids at my high school, but also for those kids who didn't have me to reach out to. So, so I try to really understand the problem. And so there's this incredibly complex problem of educational inequity and a really stark lack of resources, especially for minority, low-income populations, etc. And I try to boil down that problem to, um, I guess, a really simple solution. So for me, that answer came to me in the form of mentorship. So if I could just provide mentorship to these students, then I think that would be super pivotal in how they not navigate the college admissions process. So that is how, essentially, like the idea of the mentorship project came to me and why I eventually wanted to um, really kickstart it and have that for my community and also um, communities across America. We launched in early June, and so sort of our mission is to democratize college access for underprivileged students. The way we've been primarily doing that is providing mentorship to these students. So we match high school and particularly seniors and juniors with high achieving undergraduate mentors to aid them throughout the college application process. And that's been sort of a really incredible initiative that I've been a part of um, and that I've sort of onboarded, um, onboarded a, lot of, a lot of other people to be a part of as well. So we launched, you know, early June with a small team of about four people and we've grown a lot since then. We have about, I think, 25 eboard members and we've had over 500 mentor and mentee signups from like really across the world. So I think it's something like 18 countries, 35 U.S. states, et cetera, and we're sort of growing day by day. Um, But what's most meaningful for me is to be able to, again, democratize social capital to those who traditionally like don't have it or haven't been able to have it. You know, provide for students who might have been like exactly in my shoes. And, you know, something I know that was pivotal for me through the college app process was having a mentor. So being able to, to provide that in such a tangible way 
through the, through the mentorship project to those who need it the most has been incre incredibly meaningful for me. So yeah, so that's sort of like an initiative that I've taken that I've loved to have been a part of and love to develop and grow. Um, it's taught me a ton about sort of myself, about leadership, about how to handle myself and, you know, running an organization and recruiting people and sort of maintaining talent and really outreaching and helping out students as well. Like just listening to your message, I think I see how your passion for like equity and getting rid of like the disparities that kind of make life unbearable for a lot of people. I think that ties into a lot of your passions and I see that kind of theme and I'm just amazed. Just how you connect and you're not afraid to reach out. I think that's a amazing like personality and attitude to have. As we close off this episode, I usually leave a guest to talk about or to leave a message, a final message to the audience on whatever they want. And it doesn't have to relate to any of the other messages that you've talked to uh, talked about before in this episode. So do you want to give our audience any final messages or any lessons that they should take away? <laughs> yeah, I, I think a really sort of important mantra that I've carried with myself throughout the years and that I would love to share with people is to take risks and to take really big risks, um, especially if you're sort of younger, because I feel like um, at this age, like being in college, this is really one of the only times where you'll kind of be free of any real responsibility, for example, like having a career, having a job. So taking as many risks as possible, um, especially now, is so pertinent. And again, I think this ties back into why I've been able to explore so much and why I haven't been afraid of doing that or why I've you know, been writing a book or why I've launched a nonprofit. I, I think it comes down to taking risks and really believing sort of in what I'm doing. So yeah, and maybe this is just sort of like the entrepreneur within me, but I think taking risks is, is so important. Um, and it really teaches you a lot about yourself, even if sort of everything that you pursue isn't um, a success per se. I, I think you get so much out of it either way. That's a great lesson. I think right now when we don't have to file for taxes and when we don't have to actually reach out to people so we can have like a job and all that, I think this time of freedom is like the perfect time to actually explore and see what you want to do for the next 20, 30, whatever years of your life. And although you might not figure it out completely by the time you do go to college, the, the ability to like explore could kind of set you on like different fields and see like what you like the best. So I think that's great advice. I think some people actually need to hear that a lot because some people are so fixated on one subject that they don't try to explore outside it and see what they like also. Thank you so much for coming on to this episode, Abigail. Thank you so much for coming on this episode, Abigail. It was an honor to have you on this episode and we really enjoyed talking with you about your interests and how you've gone about exploring it. And also Final Mantra really spoke to me. Thank you so much again for coming on this episode. Yeah, thanks so much to the both of you for having me. I mean, I love sort of the podcast and love what you guys are doing. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, always happy to chat at any other time. And if people want to reach out to me, I can kind of like plug my email address. So it's <laughs> a Romero, so that's A-R-O-M-E-R-O -E at college.harvard.edu. I love like sitting and chatting with people at any time. So feel free to reach out to me that way. And thank you so much for tuning in to The Synapse. We really hope that you enjoy this conversation just as much as we did. And we hope that you also got something new out of this episode. Feel free to let us know of any new topics that you would like to see us cover and more details about the mentorship project that we've mentioned uh, in this episode uh, can be found in the show notes. And Abigail's email is also included in the show notes if you would like to drop her a note or just say hi. We hope that you have a great rest of your summer or start to your school year.